Hi, welcome back to Educator. Today we're going to talk about another spectroscopy uh, analytical tool uh, that's called mass spectrometry. Now mass spectrometry does not involve the um, absorption of light like we had in infrared IR spectroscopy. Uh, NMR, we had the absorption of energy um, from radio waves, radio frequencies. Um, so because it's not an absorption of light, we don't call it a spectroscopy, even though that's uh, you, that word is used a lot. Uh, the correct term is mass spectrometry. Uh, slight difference in the word there. Uh, you usually call it mass spec for short. And uh, as the name implies, it has something to do with the mass of a molecule. So what we can use mass spec to um, to learn about a, the structure of a molecule is we can determine its molecular mass. So that's a great um, analytical tool. Let's say you've uh, isolated an unknown compound uh, from a natural product and you want to characterize, you want to learn something about it. Uh, one thing you could do is, is find out how much it weighs, what's its molecular mass. And if you have a high resolution mass spec, if you can um, find out very, very precisely what its molecular mass is, you can actually uh, learn what its molecular formula is. So instead of doing an elemental analysis to determine its molecular formula, we can learn that information from the mass spec. <clears throat> uh, in addition, it tells us some structural information. We're going to maybe figure out what, how the molecule is put together um, when we look at the mass spectrum of that molecule. Uh, not quite as much structural information as we might get from the proton NMR, where it tells you, you know, exactly which carbons are connected with which carbons and so on. But, you know, when we use all of these uh, spectroscopic techniques in conjunction with each other as, a, as you know, um, all, all looking at every single avenue for a given unknown compound, um, that's when we really, um, they can kind of uh, feed into each other and build on each other and we come up with a, a precise structure. Uh, another very useful um, tool is to use this in conjunction with gas chromatography. So GC is something we use to separate a mixture of compounds. So if you um, can sh shoot a you know, mixture into a GC and have them spread out, like column chromatography, have them spread out uh, into different, their different components. And then at the end, instead of just having a detector that says, ooh, you know, something came out, there's an organic molecule coming out and indicating the presence of that. If it feeds into a mass spectrometer, then not only do you know that a component has exi exited the column, but then you take a mass spec of that component, you find out what its molecular weight is, and again, something about its structural information. So this is an extremely powerful analytical tool. It's called GCMS for gas chromatography and mass spectrometry together. Uh, and, and that's uh, just uh, very routinely used in the uh, analysis of mixtures. <clears throat> so how does mass spectrometry work? How do you uh, go about achieving a mass spectrum? So first of all, let's, as let's assume we have a neutral molecule uh, just represented by these little shapes here. And we have this sample. We're going to inject it into the GC, and it's going to be vaporized. So the first thing we do is we heat it up and turn it into a gas. Okay, then it's going to be um, blasted with a beam of electron, um, a a beam of electrons, and it's going to ionize it. Um, so this known is called this is known as IE uh, process uh, ionization, uh, uh, electron ionization. And what happens when you hit a molecule with a beam of electrons? It causes an electron to be ejected from uh, from the compound. So a, an electron is going to be ejected from each molecule. So now we have an unpaired electron, so it's going to be now a radical. So remember, electrons come in pairs, they're either bonded pairs or they're non-bonded pairs, or they're either a lone pair or they're part of a double bond or a single bond or a triple bond. So electrons always come in pairs. So if you remove an electron from a neutral molecule, you now have a radical somewhere, an unpaired electron. Furthermore, you have a positive charge because that electron you removed had a negative charge. So if you started out neutral, the molecule now has, uh, has a positive charge. So what we get are radical cations. Radical cations are the species that are formed in um, mass spectrometry. And um, this, this molecule is still intact. It's still a complete molecule. And there's essentially no change in mass. Remember, an electron has an insignificant mass compared to the neutrons and the protons in the molecule. So although we've imparted a charge on the molecule, uh, or caused a charge to, to form, we have not changed the mass. And, and uh, so we'll, ana we'll analyze this to get the mass of the parent. Uh, 
Um, but then what happens is this is a very high energy um, environment and so fragmentation occurs. So what happens is these molecules break apart one way or another to split up into radicals and cations. So we're going to get some fragments that are, that are cations, some fragments that are radicals. We're going to get a mixture then of both charged and uncharged particles. Okay? Then this passes through a magnetic field and causes a deflection of the charged compounds so the uncharged compounds don't bend and continue on to the detector, but the charged compounds do. Um, and it, ch it, it separates them based on their mass to charge ratio. So we call that the M over Z. Uh, that's, that's read as mass to charge. Usually the charge is plus one. Almost always the charge is plus one. So essentially what we're doing is, is by bending it through this magnetic field, we're separating the molecules, um, the fragments, by their masses. So they're, you know, we're starting out all together, they break apart, and then they spread out and they, and they uh, get separated by their mass. So we have these various charged particles now as a result, and the lower mass compound, uh, the lower mass fragment is going to travel at a uh, faster rate than the higher mass fragment. And this one that is the complete molecule intact that has not undergone any fragmentation, we describe this as uh, M plus, that's called the molecular ion because it's the complete molecule that's just been ionized by, um, by removing an electron. So that's called the molecular ion. So let's take a look at an example of a mass spectrum. This is what a mass spectrum looks like. So down on the x-axis we have our mass to charge ratio so uh, again remembering our charge is usually plus one so that, that's a uh, we're showing the various masses of the different fragments and over on the y-axis we have the relative intensity this is the abundance so what we're seeing here is a histogram how many of each mass was recorded was formed in the mass spec and then recorded in the spectrum <clears throat> so these various charged fragments, remember everything we see in a mass spec represents a charged ion, a plus one. Uh, these are going to hit the detector, records the frequency of each mass, and therefore the taller the peak, the larger the signal, that means you have a more, it's more a, a more abundant fragment. Okay, so uh, we look at this and we see lots of peaks here, little peaks, little tiny, tiny peaks even. And here's our biggest peak, the biggest peak we set to um, a value of, of 100. So this is a relative intensity. It's compared to the fragment that you have the most of. We, and we describe that as the base peak. So the base peak is the tallest peak in the mass spec. It's, called, it's defined as 100% and it sets the scale for everything else. So everything else is relative. This has about a 30% compared to the base peak and so on. <clears throat> now, why do we have a lot of this fragment? If you now the way you read a mass spec is you can literally just count over from these um, labeled hash marks, count over to see what what number, what mass we have. So here's 40. So this is 41, 42, 43. So this is a mass to charge of 43, and that's our base peak. Why do we have so much of that of that fragment? Why did that occur so much? it must, must be a very stable fragment. If this is a stable fragment, a stable cation or, or radical cation, uh, then it's, uh, if it's very stable, then it's more likely to be formed and it's going to be showing up in a higher abundance. <clears throat> um, so what we do is we look over whoever, wherever we see the highest mass, um, that's typically our molecular ion, so we call that the M plus. And I say it's, a, it's a, almost always the highest mass because sometimes our molecules are so huge or so unstable that as soon as they ionize, they fragment right away. And you never see none of the full molecular ion makes its way to the detector. So it's possible that no molecular ion um, is evident, um, but that's that's. It, well, it depends on what you're studying, but typically in the problems we're working on, you will see a molecular ion, and it's, it's, it's going to be the highest one. So here we have a molecular, uh, the molecular ion is at mass to charge of 100 in this case, uh, and that's the mass given in atomic mass units. <clears throat> and that's how we would find out, looking at the mass spectrum of this compound, 
we would say, oh, it we know it has a molecular mass of 100 there. Um, so a few other things we want to point out. The, the mass to charge of 43, our most stable fragment, if you compare that to the molecular iron of 100, you see that um, if we have only 43 mass units remaining, that means it broke off a fragment that weighed the, that was the difference of that, of, of 57. So another way that you can describe this is you can call this M minus 57. So um, it's, it, it, we, there's 43 mass units remaining, and a, uh, we know that a break occurred in the molecule to remove 57 mass units from it. So um, there's a couple ways that you can describe a, a peak that way. <clears throat> And kind of like IR, which had a lot of peaks, a lot of stretches throughout the spectrum, we don't try and analyze every, other, every peak. We just pick out the major ones, okay? And the same is going to be true for mass spec. You're going to see lots and lots of fragments. Molecules can just break apart in, in all sorts of ways. But we're going, to look for the most, we're going to look for significant peaks. And typically, when you're given a mass spec, you'll be asked to um, you know, discuss certain peaks, and that's what we'll be doing today. <clears throat> Now, this is um, interesting. We have our um, molecular ion here at 100, but if you look very, very carefully, this arrow, is, this arrow is off a little bit, sorry. If you look very, very carefully, you'll see that we have a second little peak, very tiny, um, at 101. So we would describe that peak as M plus 1 because it has one atomic mass unit higher than the parent. So... Um, why is that? What, what would cause a molecule? Now, remember, this is what's interesting about mass spec is we're recording the mass of single molecules and single fragments. So if we're looking one molecule at a time, what would cause a molecule that, that has a mass of 100 to sometimes weigh 101, to sometimes have a, a, a 101 you know, grams per mole or something like that when, we, when we're looking at um, <clears throat> the molecular mass? Well, let's think about a single molecule and consider how, a, um, how we calculate the mass or how we determine the mass. Okay, so if we have methane, CH4, the mass of that will be the mass of a carbon atom, and that's 12, and the mass of four hydrogens, those are one each, uh, four times one. So we're going to get 16. AMU is, are the units we're dealing with, atomic mass units. So that we would expect if we ran a mass spec on methane, we would expect to find our molecular ion or M plus peak at 16. Okay, but remember we have uh, some carbons that are not C12, but instead C13. So what does it mean to be an isotope? It means that you have a different number of neutrons in your molecule. So carbon 12, uh, carbon 12 has six protons, that's what makes it carbon, and six neutrons. So we add those together and that's how we get 12. But, every, uh, but, but about 1%, so not many, but about 1% of carbon atoms exist as C13, so they have an extra neutron. So when that one molecule out of every 100, when that one molecule comes through the mass spec, we're going to see that uh, the carbon does not weigh 12, it weighs 13, plus we have our four hydrogens, and it's going to be 17 AMUs. And so that's the, uh, that's the molecule that's going to give rise to this M plus 1 peak. And because C13 occurs about 1%, you know, at 1 out of every 100 uh, carbon atoms, this M plus 1 peak is going to be only about 1% of the relative intensity of the M plus peak, and that's pretty small because our molecular ion, oops, <laughs> uh, our molecular ion peak is is usually not a very large peak because fragmentation usually occurs quite readily. Um, so it's usually a small peak. So we're looking at one percent. So it's it it might be um, very very small. Okay, but what if we had two carbons? Let's think about um, the the what would the molecular ion look like for uh, ethane C2H6? Okay, well now we have. <clears throat> CH3, CH3, if we look at, if we, if we kind of have a, a bag full of ethane molecules and we pull one out, okay, one of them might have, uh, most of them are going to have both of these as C12. So let's say about for every 100 of these molecules, we're going to have one 
where there is a C13 on the first molecule, on the first carbon atom, and we're going to have uh, about 1% of them will have a C13 on the second carbon atom. So approximately, you know, one for each of those. So it would more precisely be for every 200, we get one of these and one of these. Okay, so um, what that tells us though, if we have two carbons, <clears throat> then our M plus one is about 2% of the M plus and so on. So actually this is something that, uh, uh, you know, someone and uh, someone who's really studying the mass spec and knows it very well, um, that person is going to look at the size of that M plus one peak, and we're gonna that's going to tell us something about how many carbons there are in that molecular ion. So that's a little bit of an analytical tool we can have. So sometimes that it can be big if it's a very large molecule. That M plus one peak might be significant because we've really increased. Let's say you have thirty carbons you've really increased the chances, the likelihood that one of those carbons is going to be a C13 and every time we have one of those molecules they're always, they're always going to fall in that same slot where it's one more than the molecular ion. <clears throat> okay, so the take home message is that the number of carbon atoms affects the relative height of the M plus one peak. It's usually very small but um, it, it, it is going to be there.